What I'm going to talk to you about today is the implementation of our regulations in New York City. And I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, a little story about how that played out. And unfortunately, I do have to make a presentation tomorrow up in the Adirondacks. I need to get out of here before rush hour. <laughs> uh, as you can see, in lunch, I got my dinner. <laughs> right? So I am going to do my presentation. I'm going to make my way out. My last slide here is, uh, you'll see my email address. You can forward me uh, questions. You know, I'll work with our team to get those answered. Uh, Bruce is here. He's my colleague from the Bureau of Communicable Disease up in the city. He may be able to answer a couple of questions also. And if he doesn't, I think he's very good at taking notes, and he can pass those on to me. All right, very good. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is cooling towers blow air slide leaks in the air, causing illness. There's our cooling tower, and guess what? It looks a lot like a smokestack, right? Back you guys in the 70s with the Clean Air Act, you know, they, they passed regulations trying to deal with NOx, SOx, PM10. So what is that all about? It's about internalizing a negative externality, for those of you who remember your economics from way back when, right? So the cost associated with this form of pollution, right, is put under the health of the people that may breathe and breathe and need aerosolized Legionella, right? Just like the cost associated with smog and smoke but on the chronic health effects associated with those things. This is kind of a very similar thing, at least in, in a regulatory world, in an economics type of world, right? And so how do we deal with that? Well, just like the Clean, Mar or the Clean Air Act sends a signal to the market with regulations, New York City decided to do the same thing. But before we get into New York City's example, here are here are some of the different types of signals that you can send to a market. This is also a story about knowledge dissemination, right? This is also a story about knowledge dissemination. Everybody here in this room understands the risks associated with Legionella, but building and cooling towers, but building owners don't necessarily understand that, right? And they're not going to do something about it unless they do understand it. And so the first thing you have to do is identify the risk. There's subject experts. So you can imagine back in the 1970s with the Clean Air Act, and also in the 1970s after the first uh, Philadelphia Legionella. By the way, I was alive in the 1970s. <laughs> I know this job is actually giving me more gray hair. Um, so back then, um, you know, you, you, you had the, the first signal coming out. Uh, where's Jen? Jen talked a little bit about legal exposure. Is she here? Where is she? Okay, she talked a little bit about legal exposure, and that's another great market signal, right, for people to start to do things. Um, these guys are going to talk to you about standard setting, right? Again, once you have knowledge disseminated through a community, that community begins to look at that knowledge and say, this is a good thing to do, and we need to set some standards, right? And then what if the public thinks it's a good thing to do, right? So everybody in this room, we all know about it. Most of us think it's a good thing to do, I would assume. Once the public hears about it, that when legislation and regulation gets developed. So what happened in New York City in 2015? Anybody? Oh, we had an outbreak, right? The public heard about it. We mobilized, right? And that's when regulation happens. It's the same thing with the Cuyahoga River setting on fire and the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act being passed, right? Public outrage, right? That gets things going. So what actually did happen in New York City? Well, the outbreak, August 2015, local law was passed, updated the city administration, uh, administrative code. Did that in three ways. Three things happened there. <clears throat> Uh, there was an update to the administrative code in the Department of Buildings, not the Department of Health. The Department of Buildings got the power to start a registry. They were going to check on annual certification of cooling towers. That's, and I'm not going to get into the details here, but there's a self-certification that cooling tower owners have to send in every year saying they're, they're trying to be in compliance. 
and they also handle decommissioning. So these are all very much record keeping type of things, right? Registration, annual certification, decommissioning, all department buildings type of stuff. And then the Department of Health, we handle the big stuff, right? Well, I shouldn't say the big stuff, but we handle the details. And the details are the rules and regs that were passed or promulgated. And these are commissioner's rules, and there are many different types of rules, but these are commissioner's rules, and they were promulgated in May of 2016. And they apply to all cooling towers in New York City. Now I say cooling towers because that's how the local law is written, and I'm not going to get into the details here, but we actually inspect on a cooling tower system basis. Okay, so a cooling tower system could have multiple cooling towers. And there's a whole crazy definition argument that we have or discussion we have about some of these things. Again, registration and certification, and that's from the Department of Buildings. The biggest thing is the maintenance program and plan, which consists of a risk management assessment. These guys are going to talk about plans, right? And all those plans, Jen mentioned it earlier, they're based on identifying the risk, right? Identifying risk and figure out what to do. We require a maintenance program and plan in place for cooling tower systems. And this is the building owner telling us what, to, what they're going to do to manage that engineered system, right? So that's what must be done. And in the operational record, this is another big requirement. This is proof that what you said you were going to do in your plan, you're going to do. You got to write it down, right? We all know that basis for management. What gets written down gets done. What gets measured gets done. So you got to show us, and our inspectors are out there doing that. So those were probably the two biggest things. The other thing that the regs did is it provided some minimums, okay, it provided some minimums. Minimums with regards to inspection, operation, and maintenance. Probably the biggest minimum, which is treatment, it required systems to have treatment, cooling tower systems to have treatment. Before the regs into place, I can tell you there were cooling tower systems that probably had no treatment to kill uh, bacteria and Legionella. It, per it required validation sampling and corrective actions, okay? Legionella and heterotrophic bacteria. It also requires verification, right? So that's that record keeping stuff a little bit. Tell us what you're going to do, right? These are all the minimal requirements. Now let's think about this for a minute. If you put all our economics hats on, we're bringing in minimums, right? What are minimums going to do? They're going to raise the floor, right? They're going to raise the floor. Everybody's got to meet the minimum. A little bit of the side effect on this is sometimes a minimum can actually lower the ceiling, right? Because now we have a market and we just got a signal from our regulatory agency that said, you got to do this, right? Everybody's got to do this. So if I'm a, a business owner, right, and I'm looking to see cost is important, I may just try to do the minimum. And because my regulatory agency just said, you know, we all trust the Department of Health, right? We're, set, we're setting minimums. It must be protective. It's, it's the Department of Health is saying it must be protective. And so that's the minimum. So now, if I was doing more than a minimum, I might be coming back down for a cost basis down to those minimum standards. So while we're raising the floor, there's a potential for those folks who are doing more that we could actually be lowering the ceiling. So let's talk a little bit about our market. We're going to, now I just told you a little bit about what happened in New York City. Here's our regulated market. There's about 1.4 million buildings in New York City. It's bigger than a lot of cities population, right? 4,000 cooling tower systems, lots of different interesting ownership and management relations. Okay, tenants and owners, lots of different interesting relationships. The regulation holds the owner of the building with the cooling tower responsible. Okay, not a lessee, right? Not a lessee. And so that's, that's changed 
some of how the leases in New York City have been getting written, right? It's very interesting. We have varying resources and knowledge across these buildings, right? I talked a little bit earlier how about this is all about knowledge dissemination, right? And we use a lot of different languages. That makes things difficult. You know, we had our Russian community, our Chinese community. And all of these buildings are used for different things. Varying usage can make it difficult. So that's our market. So I told you earlier, we regulate building owners and buildings, okay? Anybody here a building owner? No. How much do you think a building owner knows about <laughs> Legionella and building water systems? Probably not a ton, okay? Now, who here might be a water treatment vendor? I know we got some of them. Raise your hands if you're kind of on that consulting side of things. Oh, come on. I know I got more. Come on, get them up. All right, don't be shy. You guys are the knowledge, right? You're who building owners are talking to, right? They're going to you guys, right? And there are many different types of folks here, right? There's labs, there's engineers, there's industrial hygienists, right? So we've got lots of different folks and lots of different market niches providing lots of different products and lots of different services. Here are some of them, okay? Now before the race, this was it, right? Vendors out there, looking, trying to sell their products, telling you about the risk, right? All that, uh-oh, now the regs come in. They gotta do that all now through, a, through the filter of the regulations for cooling tower systems. Remember, those regulations are the minimum, okay? So that is, although we regulate the building owners, we certainly understand that those building owners get their knowledge from the vendors, right? And this area in red, this is where that knowledge gets disseminated, all right? And this is where there's an increase in knowledge and there's sharing, all right? So those regs mediate that relationship. So what are we trying to do with this? We're trying to move the market from point A to point B. And what does that mean, right? What does that mean? So you can imagine back in the 70s, right? You might have had some folks doing building water system plans. Who, who, who is, was anybody here in the 70s, right? Building, don't raise your hand. <laughs> okay? Some of you might have been. I'm, I'm getting gray hair, so I, I'm getting there. Um, but you can imagine back then, and you've heard some people talk, the, the knowledge on this was very limited. I mean, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act didn't even really came out. There was poor communication, right? Because there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge between who might be writing the plan. There was any plan that was written was certainly kind of written based on a perceived risk. You can hear even today some folks talking about, oh, we don't quite know what the risk here is. You know, what, what's the right number for the standard and all those kind of things. And certainly with that passive management or implementation from the building side. You know, when you don't really know what's going on, uh, you tend not to manage it. So think about your car, right? We're all supposed to get that driver's manual, right? We're all supposed to do the schedule maintenance, right? But nobody really knows why you do it, right? It's just in the book, right? So you don't, and that's passive management implementation, right? And you might have inconsistent records and, and all that. You'd have a very high variation. So going to point B, oh, I'm sorry. So why did they even do this stuff back then? Well, it was mostly for equipment protection and plumbing protection, right? Scaling, corrosion, there was a cost associated with that. We knew how to protect that, right? So we would treat our water systems to prolong their life. Now, they might have had a little bit of legal exposure and certainly a time went on and certainly today there's an understanding that there's a responsibility potentially to, to manage Legionella. And there's some legal exposure associated with that. And finally, moral suasion, right? That's the economics term for doing the right thing. So back in point A, all of that risk and cost was externalized, right? Most of that was not internalized. We didn't have a lot of plans 
And instead, that Legionella was spewing out into the air through these cooling towers, and that's how things happened in Philadelphia. Now, point B is where we want to go. Oh, shoot, I went ahead. Oh, shoot again. Um, we want high understanding, all right? And we got that. Everybody in this room understands or will soon understand after talking to the panel of the importance of water management plans, right? You need formalized communication between the plan writers, the plan implemented implementers. People need to know when to act and why to act. You have control measures based on identified risk. That's that HACCP approach, right? You have active management implementation. Now that you know um, what your car can do, right? You know a little bit about cars, you might actually follow that manufacturer's rec recommendations and you might make sure it gets done. Consistent records informing implementation, right? Keeping track of things so we know when to do things. And looking at that data, right, to manage your system better. And low variation. So the plans, if everybody's sort of knowledgeable, you would expect the plans to start to look at least conceptually similar, right? Sort of the same general approaches, certainly customized, you know, by the different buildings. And now they're doing it more because they understand the risk and there's some legal exposure involved. Certainly the right thing still. Want to protect your equipment. In the end of the last session, somebody was talking about all the different trade-offs, one of the questions. Well, the trade-off here is a trade-off with health and a trade-off with protecting your equipment. There's also a potential trade-off. Potential. If you do it right, it's, it's okay. So here the risk and cost is internalized. Right? So this costs a lot to do from point B. So if you think about our market, we talked about lots of different resources, right? Big fancy buildings in Manhattan, small mom and pop grocery stores in the Bronx that might have a cooling tower. It costs money. So how do we move from A to B? Again, story about knowledge dissemination. Standard setting. These guys are going to talk about standard setting, right? Regulation, that's what we're doing. We got that public signal now. One thing I'm not going to mention about is technology. I'm just going to briefly mention about it. Technology is, I kind of think of it as embodied knowledge, right? So we know what it's embodied knowledge for a purpose. We're using technology. And technology is developing, and it can lower costs. So, moving measures. So, in moving from point A to point B, right, that team composition, that's your understanding and knowledge. We're trying to get that knowledge out. That's the understanding and knowledge. That's your team composition. And so, with uh, our cooling tower rights, we require that you have a, a team, right? And those are the people that not only know how to manage uh, Legionella risk, but also know the building the building system. I think even more importantly, they know the people who are working in the building and how those people work, right? That management component. Understanding and knowledge is part of that team. You take that knowledge and you throw it into a plan and that plan quality is the documentation of all that knowledge, right? So everybody on that team needs to look at that plan, understand that plan, know their roles and responsibilities. And that needs to go into the plan. And then plan implementation is that knowledge applied, okay? Uh, this is not easy, right? This is not easy. We're all pretty educated folks, I would imagine, in this room, and that's not necessarily the folks in the small mom and pop grocery store who are doing this work, okay? This is not easy. There's communication issues when you go from the team knowledge to writing it down, right? Institutional development issues. That's slightly easier than the institutional development issues that goes into that implementation. That's hard. That's real hard to do that well. 
So where are we here with New York City and the cooling tower right? Well, like I said earlier, we have the minimum standards for team composition. We have some minimum standards for required elements. I talked a little bit about them. We also have standards for proof of implementation, all these different records that need to be kept. And there's an institutional capacity that needs to be developed to do all of this. This increases knowledge and awareness. It reduces risk, potentially. More importantly, it internalizes that externality. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, we all want to be at point B, right? Point B is great. Point B is expensive, right? Point B, from a regulatory standpoint, is do I, as a regulator, want to be prescriptive? Hmm. I certainly don't know every cooling tower system in the city and what should be done with it. I certainly don't know all the different management styles and management complications associated with these systems. So it's very difficult for a regulator to be prescriptive. Instead, we go with sort of minimal requirements and allow the market to do what the market does. Right? Try to find the best way to meet those requirements. So, flipping the switch. And it is kind of flipping the switch, right? I mentioned earlier how regulations tend to get started. They tend to get started after a major event, right? And then there's, there's public concern about it. And sometimes those regulations can come kind of quickly. And that's what happened in New York City. And we flipped the switch in May of 2016. And our program started to ramp up. And our violations started to be issued. Not a lot in 2016. Just so you know, it might be a little different. I'm going to briefly touch on our uh, our violation system. So what we've done here, not only did we implement these regs, we sort of took a different approach from a technology standpoint to do all of this. We have over 5,000 cooling tower systems in New York. We have closing in on about 50 inspectors out there every day inspecting these systems. And the only way we could do this with the resources we had was to automate this process. And so we do have a software that our inspectors use. They go out, they, they make observations. The violations are actually determined through the logic of the algorithm and the software based on the, the, uh, the observations of the field staff. And then those get processed through our compliance unit and get automatically sent over to our uh, administ Office of Administrative Trials and, uh, trials and Hearing, our oath. So it's all automated. Uh, and trust me, that was a bit of a nightmare, but we, we did make our way through it. Um, so building owners did try to comply. And granted, the time that they had, I think they did quite a, quite a good job. Uh, we have heard anecdotally that the water industry was overwhelmed a bit at first, okay? I said 5,000 cooling tower systems, these plans got to be written quickly and implemented quickly. And uh, I think it was tough for some of the, for the industry to, to uh, get up to speed quick enough. And, and frankly, it was, it, you know, it wasn't easy for our department to get up to speed either. Uh, I did not, I really didn't have as much gray hair three years ago. Uh, where I didn't tell you, I was coming from a rural upstate New York health department, and uh, life was easy in rural upstate New York. Uh, and there was some uncertainty in the regulated community, right? Certainly a lot of uncertainty on what was going to happen. So in the late fall of 2016 and early 2017, violations started to be heard. Uh, and we were starting to get a fair amount of feedback from both building owners through our uh, building owner management association and our real estate board in New York, as well as water treatment vendors. And they asked us, especially the vendors asked us to look at their plans and provide some comments on their, on their plans. And we did. And those were some of the things that we saw, lack of specificity, 
a lack of logical organization, some missing required elements, and little customizing to specific systems. And uh, we also got a lot of feedback with regards to, um, you know, you can imagine from any regulated community, why are you doing this? This is this is not protective, and 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 you know, we're getting violations. Nobody likes to get violations. That has eventually dropped off. We also got a lot of feedback, also very much in support from the regulated community. Um, we had some software changes in early 2017, which really streamlined things. And at that point, we had finished about 1,500 inspections. Okay. Yes, five minutes. I'm just about done. Perfect timing. Mm -hmm. Second iteration, the market has had some time. Plans have improved. We're still getting feedback from the regulated community. It's getting better. It's getting better. And now I'm going to show you how it's getting better. So in 2016, these are some of our major violations. Did a plan exist? Did records exist? Did systems have daily automatic treatment? They're not required to have daily automatic treatment, but it does make it easier. And here's what we see now. Lots of improvement there, right? Things are getting better. Same thing with the risk assessment. Did they have a risk assessment? with the proper element, and then they have a record of all four of the previous 90-day compliance inspections. And there they are, and we've got improvement. Now, the number for the compliance inspections is probably a little low because remember we're looking back at all four years, or I'm sorry, all four quarters, and probably those first quarters would have been missing, but I, I, I expect that to improve even more. I think this is the most telling graph, and this shows the number of violations found per inspection by type by quarter. And you can see from the very beginning to today how many violations there are per inspection. And it has dropped significantly. And what I anticipate will happen is we'll kind of level off here. Um, just briefly, and I don't want to going into too much detail here. PHHs are public health hazards. We do have 20, 30 different violations we can issue. Three of them are considered public health hazards. Um, 14 of them, I could be wrong, 14 of them are critical, more, more uh, severe, and 13 of them are general, less severe violations, okay? But regardless of what category, they have all Dropped. That's my name. That's my email address. Feel free to send me an email with questions. Bruce, raise your hand, Bruce. Bruce, my colleague at BCD, he can potentially answer some questions during the session, but he'll take good notes and get them back to me if he can. So with that, I'd like to thank you.